Thank you, Seth. That is a great quote. You come up with great quotes every Sunday, so I appreciate it. Oftentimes they fit with the very thing I'm going to teach on. You can't go wrong quoting John C. Ryle, Bishop of Liverpool, great man. Well, we are on, in chapter 20 this morning, which means we're drawing to a close on this great fourth gospel. Jesus had been buried. He was buried late Friday. They had to hurry because at sundown the Sabbath began. And the Sabbath is now past. And we read beginning with verse 1 of chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping... And looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came, following him, and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then, also entered, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. In March, I visited a peaceful garden in Jerusalem with my daughter and son-in-law. We stood before an ancient tomb where some say Jesus was buried. I don't know that it is. What I do know is what I saw is what the disciples saw 2,000 years ago. A tomb that's empty. That's important. In fact, it's so important that all Christianity is based on it. Now, some skeptic might object. There's nothing unusual in that. There are empty tombs all over Jerusalem, all over the Middle East. The Valley of the Kings in Egypt is full of empty tombs robbed by bandits. That's true. But what Pharaoh predicted that he would be raised from the dead, actually resurrected on the third day. Christ did that more than once. And the ancient scriptures prophesied it. No, the empty tomb is the fulfillment of prophecy. And what's more, it is proof that the sixth of the Lord's seven sayings from the cross is true. Tetelestai. It is finished. That was a cry of victory, of the work completed. But at the time he spoke, that may have sounded to some who were standing around the cross like a cry of defeat. All is lost. And if Jesus' life had ended there with his death on the cross and his burial in the tomb, it is finished would have meant He was conquered by death and his life was a complete loss. And your life as well is a complete loss as is mine. But it didn't end there. Three days later, the tomb was found empty. That was the proof of victory. Or as someone has said, the resurrection is God's amen to Jesus' loud cry, it is finished. 
That's what we celebrate today. That's what we celebrate every Sunday. So let's look at John's account of the resurrection and the evidence for it with the moved stone, the empty tomb, and the grave clothes. It was early in the morning when these things were first discovered. John begins the chapter. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. Now he could have described her arrival as being at uh, early dawn as the other Gospels do. But John gives the time in a more suggestive way with some symbolism intended. She came while it was dark. And darkness is a prominent symbol in John's writings. It illustrates the ignorance and the the spiritual condition of the unbelieving world. But here it illustrates Mary's understanding. Because when she came to the tomb, her knowledge of Jesus' condition differed very little from the world's. She was in the dark. But that was true of all of the Lord's followers that Sunday morning. Their devotion to Jesus had not dimmed. It was brave devotion to Jesus that moved Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, as John recorded in chapter 19, to take his body down publicly from the cross and give it a royal burial with spices. But spices were used to cover the offensive effects of decay. And the fact that they buried him in that way showed that they expected Jesus' body to remain in the tomb. When the large stone was rolled in place, they walked away from it with great sadness and without hope. It was the same with the disciples. They spent their Sabbath in sorrow Even though Jesus had told them clearly that he would suffer and he would die, and on the third day he would rise again. He told them that on more than one occasion, but they didn't grasp the truth. And so for them, that first Easter morning began in darkness, just as it did for Mary Magdalene. Now Mary is a story in herself. She is an example of loving dedication to Jesus Christ. We're first introduced to her in John's Gospel at the cross. She is one of the four women mentioned in chapter 19. She had remained to the end, then followed Joseph and Nicodemus to the grave. As the sun set, she left and waited until the Sabbath ended. Then Sunday morning, even before the sun had risen... She returned, drawn back to the tomb by her love for Christ. Someone said, she was last at his cross and first at his grave. She could not rest till she was up to seek him. We know why. In chapter 8 of Luke's Gospel, he records that when Jesus healed her, Seven demons had gone out. She had lived a life of mental torment, of of, of fear and despair. But Jesus delivered her from that. He gave back to her a sound mind. She was like a brand plucked from the fire. But for all her love for Jesus, she lacked understanding. So when she arrived at the tomb, she was shocked and deeply disturbed by what she found there. She saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Her first thought was grave robbers. Now that was a common, that's a common explanation for the empty tomb even today. There uh, must be some explanation men think apart from the supernatural, and that seems like a very reasonable explanation. Well, men broke into it, and they stole the body. It seemed reasonable to Mary. So thinking the tomb had been violated, she ran off to tell Peter and John. She she wasn't alone when this happened. 
We know that from the other Gospels, that she had come to the tomb with other women. John doesn't mention that, but he does suggest it in what she said to the disciples. They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So her statement, we do not know, indicates that she had been in the company of the other women. John recognized that. But John's purpose here was to single out Mary for his account. He was interested in her response to the Lord's appearance to her later. So he focused on her as one of the central figures of chapter 20. And from Mary's account of, of what she saw, there is no indication that she thought of a resurrection when she saw the stone moved away, that that thought never entered her mind, though the evidence of a resurrection was certainly there. Verse 1 reports that she saw the stone taken away. And that description implies a supernatural removal of it. The, the verb that's used there, taken away, it means lifted up, taken up. So it wasn't just rolled away, it was literally lifted up out of the groove in which it was set, and it was lying there on the ground. It was a large stone that was removed, extremely large, according to Mark chapter 16, verse 4. So John could be indicating here violence, the, the kind of force and power that moved that stone. In fact, that's this word taken up is used in Revelation 18, verse 21, of an angel taking up a large stone like a great millstone and casting it into the sea and then pronouncing judgment on Babylon the Great. Well, that's probably what's pictured here because Matthew tells us that an angel moved it with great power. And our first thought is that he moved the stone in order to let Christ out. But that wasn't the reason. We know that because Jesus could pass through closed doors and he could, he, he could uh, walk through... Uh, solid walls. He'll demonstrate that later in this book. Now the stone wasn't moved to let Christ out of the tomb. It was moved to let the disciples in so that they could see and know the good news of his victory and his power over the grave. But when Mary first saw it, it wasn't good news to her at all. She interpreted the evidence of the resurrection as a tragedy. They have taken away the Lord. Her response was not untypical of Christians when they are in difficulty. They, we, sometimes lose perspective and draw the wrong conclusions, much as Jacob did in Genesis 42. I love this story. I love this account of Jacob's life because it's so typical. Canaan was in a famine. All was dying. And so he sent his sons down to Egypt to buy some grain. And they ran into difficulty with the man there who was the prime minister. He didn't trust them. In fact, he kept one of the sons and said, I want this last son of yours to be brought down next time, and I'm going to keep this son, Simeon, until you do. And so, as Joseph is sitting there, he's, remember he, he'd been told years before that his favorite son Joseph was killed by a beast. And now, Simeon was a hostage in Egypt, hostage to this very angry and, and troublesome prime minister, maybe dead as well. And now he learns that they want to take Benjamin down there the last son that he had from Rachel. So in despair, he cried out, Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. He didn't know that, but Simeon is no more. And you would take Benjamin? All these things are against me. When in fact, all those things were for him. 
Simeon was well. Joseph was alive and he was ruling Egypt. He was the prime minister. And soon Jacob would be reunited with them and he would be living in great prosperity. Well, Mary made the same error. She misinterpreted the facts. The empty tomb was good news. And the first step in her reunion with the Lord. But she had not interpreted the facts by the Lord's teaching. Again, he had on more than one occasion told the disciples that he would be raised from the dead. But because she and the others had neglected the Lord's teaching, or that may be a little harsh, we do that, we neglect it. But they simply just not, did not understand it. It didn't compute with them. They didn't, they didn't get a hold of its meaning. But nevertheless, because they didn't understand the Scriptures and the revelation God had given, they couldn't see the blessing when the evidence was right before their eyes. So she assumed the body was stolen. That's what we all do when we try to interpret the events of our lives apart from the Word of God. We face an alarming situation and respond to it the way the world does. Well, that happened here. When she arrived and told the disciples what she and the others had found, they were puzzled by it. They didn't pause to ask questions, at least as far as we know. They, they left quickly, immediately, and ran off to investigate. Verse 3, So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. Attempts have been made to give allegorical interpretations to John's arrival at the tomb first. But rather than try to find some symbolism in it or some hidden meaning, I think it's better to understand that John was simply reporting the facts, which suggested that, that he was swifter than Peter, and he was swifter than Peter because he was probably younger than Peter. But he had to explain how it is he got there first, and that's what he did. And having gotten there first, he hesitated to go in. Maybe he was spooked about entering a tomb. Instead, verse 5 states that he stooped and looked in, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there. The fact that they were lying there indicates that they were undisturbed. The wrappings and the powdered spices that had been sprinkled between the folds of the linen strips were all still in place, but without the body. Mary had reported that someone had taken the Lord, but it would have been impossible for them to have unwrapped his body and then rewrapped the linen bands with, with the spices. The, the evidence was that something else had happened, that the body had actually passed through the clothes. The clothing that he left behind would have then collapsed under the weight of, of the spices. You remember Nicodemus brought a hundred pounds of spices, and so there were a lot of spices, a lot of weight, and that would have collapsed the, uh, the, the wrappings. So when, when John saw them, they were, they were lying flat. From the entrance, though, the entrance of the tomb, looking into this dark sepulcher, John couldn't see everything. F.F. F. Bruce describes John as peeping into the tomb. Then Peter arrived a moment later, and true to his impetuous personality, he rushed inside the tomb and looked around. He saw what John had seen, the linen wrappings lying there, but also something that John didn't notice. Verse 7 adds, And the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. The face cloth was separated from the linen strips and had been rolled or wrapped around the Lord's head like a turban. 
and without the spices. So it, it kept its concave rolled shape. And John writes that it was not lying with the wrappings, meaning there was a gap between it and the grave clothes, the space between his head and his shoulders. So the, the wrappings are lying there, there's a space, and then the turban or the face cloth is there, still rolled up the way it had been when it was put on his head. So everything was arranged in an orderly state, left untouched, with no evidence of the wild confusion that would have occurred if grave robbers had entered the tomb. In fact, if grave, grave robbers had stolen the body, they would not have left behind the expensive linen and valuable spices. But it was all there, undisturbed, without the body. Now, Peter saw all of this, and he looked at it more carefully than John did. The, the word used of Peter seeing is different from the word used of John. Here, the word is, is the Greek word theorio. We get our word theory from it. And it has the idea of a careful look. It has the idea of a look of thought, thoughtful look. Peter scrutinized everything, wondering what it all meant. There's nothing in the text that indicates that Peter understood at that moment what had happened. But John did. Peter's entrance into the tomb gave John some courage to enter also. And, and when he did that, he saw everything. The grave clothes and the face cloth. And when he got the full picture, the face cloth in relation to the grave clothes, verse 8 says, he saw and believed. This word for seeing is different from the other words that were used. In, in verse 5, John saw, but it was, it was like a glance. He peeped in to the tomb. Here, the word has a sense of seeing with perception, with spiritual understanding. And seeing all these things, the moved stone, the empty tomb, the undisturbed grave clothes, John suddenly understood what had happened. It was the only explanation. Jesus had risen from the dead. But it wasn't just the empty tomb and grave, and grave clothes that, that uh, caused John to believe because an empty tomb by itself is just a tomb that's empty. That had to be explained. There must be an explanation for that condition. And the Bible gives that. It was the scriptures that John believed. Before, before that, he said, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. What scripture John meant is not stated. He doesn't quote a scripture. It's not clear whether he meant a single text of scripture or that when he speaks of the scripture, it means the scriptures as a whole that testify in the Old Testament to the resurrection. But it could be a reference to Psalm 16 or Psalm 110. Both of those psalms were cited days later by Peter on the day of Pentecost as proof of the resurrection. He stood before this large gathering of people, thousands of people, and he spoke to them of the Lord's death. And then he quoted David from Psalm 16, who wrote, You will not abandon my soul to Hades, or allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Now, it could be said of David that God did not abandon his soul to Hades, but it could not be said of him that he did not undergo decay. And Peter makes that very point in his sermon. He said that David both died and was buried. In fact, the tomb, his tomb is with us to this day. And they all knew that. They knew where that tomb was. In fact, I think I may have seen it with my my daughter and son-in-law, as we were walking through the very old city, the, the city of David, you can see it down there. So they knew where to look. And if they'd looked, they'd known that there, the 
bones of David were there. So this wasn't about David, but it was true of Jesus. His tomb was empty. God raised him up seven weeks earlier from the day of Pentecost when this was preached. And, and that, Peter said, is what David prophesied in Psalm 16. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, he said, to which we are all witnesses. If you remember, before the Lord had ascended into heaven, at the beginning of the book of Acts, he'd been there for 50 days, speaking to hundreds of people. So this was a very public thing. And now he has ascended to heaven. He has taken his seat at God's right hand. And that's a fulfillment of Psalm 110, which John may be referring to, because there the Lord God, the Father, says to the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Well, what that means is Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the fulfillment of Scripture, the one whose death and resurrection David looked ahead to and spoke of. It's prophesied. He is the one whom John testifies to as the Christ, the Son of God, who gives life to all who believe in Him, and He gives life to the believer because He finished the work of salvation. There's nothing more to do but receive it. That's what the resurrection means. It means that His declaration, it is finished, is true. They're not words of defeat or despair, but of victory. He has accomplished the work of salvation completely. He paid the debt of our sin. He saved His people from their sins. And the resurrection is the proof of it. Do you realize what good news that is? The Bible is clear. Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. That is the fundamental teaching of the Bible. We have it all through the Word of God. From Genesis to Revelation. From the beginning, when God slew the animals in the garden and clothed Adam and Eve with their skins... The Word of God has shown that the shedding of blood was necessary because of sin. The shedding of blood was necessary in order to cover their shame. All through the Old Testament, Israel offered up bulls and goats and lambs and doves, thousands upon thousands of animals, rivers of blood flowed to demonstrate that blood must be shed for forgiveness. Bulls and goats, though, could not give that. Not ultimately. They can't remove sin. They're just a vivid picture uh, of what was required for the removal of sin, and that is sacrifice. Human effort cannot remove sin. God's good works cannot cancel out crimes. Turning over a new leaf doesn't change the past. Feeling bad and resolving to do better doesn't remove guilt. The Bible is very clear that atonement is only by sacrifice. The satisfaction of divine justice and peace with God, reconciliation, can only happen when a sufficient payment for sin is made. And man cannot make that payment. Only God can, and He has done it. He has put away sin once and for all. He has made atonement. No religion can claim that. Only Christ can give that. And the resurrection is the proof of it. It is the historical proof that God accepted His Son's sacrifice, 
that he received his payment, the father received the payment, and he demonstrated that by raising his son from the dead victorious over death and the grave. The resurrection is God's amen to Christ. It is finished. It is God's vindication of his son. But there's something else that is important to know. When Jesus went into the grave, you and I were buried with him. When he rose and ascended to heaven, you and I rose and ascended with him. Paul could write to the Ephesians that God made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places. We're seated with Him now in the heavenly places. How is that? How can that be? It can be because Christ is our representative. He acted in our place. What He did, we did in our representative. Where he is, we are in our representative. He accomplished all of that for us. He conquered the grave and he conquered death for us. And it is so certain that we will experience all of that to the full in the future that it's spoken of as already accomplished. Nothing can change it. It's absolutely fixed and certain. We are now citizens of heaven. And all of heaven is working for us. That's unique to Christ and the Christian. Plato never said he was buried with Socrates. No sage or king or religious leader claimed to die for the sins of his followers or promised to be raised from the grave and bring them to glory. Only those joined to Christ have the certain hope that heaven and the resurrection have been won for us. We have everlasting life because Christ died for us and the Father accepted His sacrifice for us. That's what the resurrection demonstrates. Now whether John understood all of that at that moment, I can't say, certainly did later, But what he did believe is in the resurrection. Believe that it had occurred. He understood. And we read in verse 10 that the disciples went away again to their own homes. They didn't go searching for the body. There was no need to. So they went home, and as they went, John rejoiced, and he must have explained to Peter what had happened, and they both rejoiced. When he reached the the house, someone in the home must have been overjoyed with the good news. Mary, the mother of Jesus, her son and Savior was alive. That's the good news. We have a living Savior. And because He lives, every believer in Jesus Christ lives with His life resurrection life, supernatural life now, and the hope of the physical bodily resurrection to come. The world does not have that. It has religion, but it doesn't have a Savior. A little over 20 years ago, I was reminded of that in an unusual way. I was in Jerusalem was in that same garden I spoke of earlier with the empty tomb. I was with a group of people quietly taking the Lord's Supper. When the silence was broken by the Muslim call to prayer from the Al-Aqsa Mosque across the street in the old city. It was strange. But a vivid reminder that there is another way, a way without a living Savior, a way of works and ritual and personal effort that is never finished and can never satisfy the holy God. What a joy to know that just as as the, the heavy stone was lifted from the tomb, 
The crushing burden of sin has been lifted from every believer in Jesus Christ by His sacrifice for us. And God said to that sacrifice, Amen, with the resurrection. Have you believed in Him? If not, then look to Jesus, who died in the place of sinners, so that all who believe in Him might have the complete forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. He, his blood canceled out all our crimes. It removes all our sins as far as the east is from the west. It, it casts our guilt behind God's back, never to be seen by Him again. The empty tomb that no skeptic in history has ever disproven that empty tomb is the proof. We have a living Savior who overcame death, who conquered the grave. Look to Him. If you have not, look to Christ and then rejoice that it is forever finished. Salvation is complete. And rejoice that you have new life, resurrection life, and then, by God's grace, walk in that life. Live in that resurrection life daily as a witness for Him. Well, before we pray, let's stand and sing hymn number 34 in the songs of praise. Jesus is Lord. Hymn number 34. Father, we praise and thank You that we have a Savior who is a living Savior. He's enthroned at your right hand in fulfillment of Psalm 110. And you're making his enemies a footstool for your feet, for his feet at this time. In this time, we are governed by a triune God and our living Savior, the second person of the Trinity, who is our high priest, who prays for us constantly who guides us with His eye, who is absolutely faithful. He will never forsake us, He said. He's all-powerful to fulfill every promise for us, which is to say we're secure. We have a living Savior. We're absolutely secure at every moment of life, how difficult it may be. The day is coming when He's coming back. The living Savior. His feet will touch the ground and He will reign on this earth and we will be triumphant and then all sorrow will cease. That's a glorious future for us. We have a past that's been paid for, a life of sin that's been paid for. Nothing can change that. We have a secure present. We have a glorious future. It's all due to your sovereign grace, your infinite, eternal, unconditional love. We give you praise and thanks for it. Encourage us with that to live a life that's honoring to you, we pray. And we pray these things in Christ's name. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.